Okay, let's go ahead and get this thing started. Uh, we'll see how this goes. This is the first time that we're trying this, obviously, but uh, welcome to the spring 2020 uh, Atlas TAM capstone presentations. Uh, I'd like to introduce our um, reviewers first before we get started. Uh, Mark Rabinowitz, are you here? I am. Thanks okay. for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So Mark is a senior design manager at Squarespace, where he leads the design and experience strategy of the full suite of marketing tools across their evolving product ecosystem. Previously as an experience strategy director at Code and Theory, Co led the team of 30 experienced strategists and interaction designers and the design of digital products and brand experiences across platforms. He's also the VP of operations on the AIGA New York Executive Board of Directors and teaches design entrepreneurs at the School of Visual Arts MFA Design Program. So Mark, thanks for being here. And then we also have um, Alia Ormit Fleischman, who's a senior product designer with experience from WeWork, Grubhub, Etsy, Foursquare, and more. Um, Alia is also one of my favorite people and collaborators who I've worked with for many, many years. So Alia, thank you so much for being here as well. Thanks for having me. Hey guys. And then Drew, did Drew get in? Drew's in, I'm gonna put him in real quick, but as I'm promoting Drew, uh, Drew Cogville is currently a senior technical product manager at the New York Times. After eight years of progressive experience at a product agency. Over the last decades, he worked on over 40 apps and fields such as gaming, healthcare, e-commerce, consumer products, education, and IoT for Disney, Oakley, and Aetna Active Health. These apps have been used in enterprise settings as well as been downloaded millions of times from the Apple App Store and Google Play. He's also taught about mobile app product and designs at Parsons, SVA, the University of Colorado Boulder, Fordham, and the University of Arkansas. Drew is also the literal godfather of one of my children. <laughs> hey, y'all. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Drew, for being here. So with, uh, without further ado, we're going to turn it over to Ben. So Ben, you can go ahead and start sharing your screen. May I begin? Do it. Hi, so my name is Napas Ben Nasutiemong, and today I will be presenting my cap capstone project called Sheffy. So what is Sheffy? Sheffy is a mobile application that allows you to hire professional chefs, really creating a unique fine dining experience right at your own home. The problem statement for this project is as the following. Planning for a unique dining experience at home, whether it be for a special family dinner to a monthly gathering of friends, requires a lot of preparation and planning ahead. Chefy allows the customer to browse and choose from a range of professional chefs who specialize in many cultural cuisines. Only the finest ingredients are selected by the chefs, providing the customer a unique dining experience right in their home. Based on three main existing platforms that were in the scope of an online hiring service, I mainly used a comparative research method to identify and discover key designs from Hire Chef, Angie's List, and Uber. These made me realize what was good in their design and what was limiting in their user usability. Starting with Hire Chef, Hire Chef is a website based platform that allows customers to search for a personal chef to prepare your meals. The chefs on the platform are provided by the U.S. Personal Chef Association. The main key takeaways that I discovered from this platform was that their search filter was just limited to the location. Also, within their chef profiles, the organization of text that was presented is clustered and not aesthetically pleasing due to little implementation of visuals. They however had a feature to send a message to the chef and add them to their contact list. I think that this is a very useful feature to have when designing within the scope. Next, we have Angie's List. It is also both a mobile and a website-based platform that allows users to search for a professional to help on your home services. One of the offers services also include both catering and chef services. The main key takeaways from Angie's List was their approach to the clean user interface design. These clear graphic interfaces, which help make navigating through the platform a simple and intuitive task to do. Lastly, we have Uber. Uber is a mobile-based platform that allows users to hire a ride. The main key takeaways from Uber is how they designed their driver profiles to be easy to understand and informative at the same time. Through the use of icons and graphics, Uber was able to present user ratings and reviews effectively. 
All this research and precedents allowed me to gain insights and idea as a guide on how my application should be designed in mind on the success and failures of this platform, these platforms. The main technology and tools that were used to create this project were Sketch and Envision. Sketch was used to mock up and draw all of the final app screens digitally, while Envision was used to put together all of the screens and link them together by using hotspots to create a proper user navigation for the app. Before using Sketch and Envision, I started off with doing hand-drawn storyboards, writing out the user flow, and drawing out low-fidelity wireframes. The main purpose of these initial steps was to learn and understand how the logic of a user on the platform should work in order to successfully navigate them from the moment when they op first open the app to the moment where they would get their confirmation of the booking. This process also helps me understand what information should be initially displayed within each page of the navigation and think about what the user should be expecting to see. Using the first few prototypes that I created, I went ahead to create a digital prototype that would help visualize the main screens better using Sketch and Envision. The reason for this is because of how it can be used to map out of how a user might navigate through the application in a more interactive way as if they were using the app and not just looking at individual screens. Initial user testing on the prototype allowed me to understand what worked and what was still lacking and needed to be added so that the user navigation was as consistent and well. After designing the initial UX screens, I implemented the first visuals and graphical assets by creating a mood board for the overall theme that I wanted to go with. I started to change certain interfaces components, such as the buttons and overall layout. Throughout the project timeline, I also had feedback from my mentors that helped guide me throughout the project. My first mentor is Kevin Cook. He has taught both UX UI design classes within the Atlas program. Kevin helped me create a worst case and best case scenario of the user using the application. This helped me think about the features that would deem as needed or not needed to be included within the scope of this app. My second mentor is Napi Kapon, he is the lead UX UI designer for the digital software house back in Bangkok, Thailand. Napi Kapon guided me mainly on the user interface and overall design looks of the graphics and use of space within the application. One of the most, feedback that, most important feedback that he gave was how the color scheme and the theme can play a huge role in the design. From what we also talked about, we also talked about the new state of the application, that it was to be high-end and premium so that it could justify the higher costs and prices. And this is why you will also see that the app has changed from a green color scheme to a black and gold color scheme. Other than the great feedback from my mentors, I also did many user testing throughout each design iteration. From all of the user testing, I found that the most important aspects to what made the app have a good UX UI design and usability was to have correct display size proportions, good implementation of useful features such as messaging, a consistent navigation through all screens of the application, and also a good content hierarchy so that information is easy to process and understand for the user. Throughout the process of user testing and gaining feedback to improve on my app design, I ended up expanding with more than 40 screens design compared with first less than 20 screens at the beginning of the project. The final screens designed on Sketch app were then uploaded onto Envision to be able to properly demonstrate how the Sheffy app would be used. Now let's go check out a live demo of the Sheffy app on Envision to quickly showcase the overall UX UI design and interactivity of this application. So here we have um, Sheffy, the app downloaded into an iPhone. If you go ahead and click launch, you'll have to allow the access for your location on your phone, hit allow. This is, brings you to the splash screen. From here, you have the option to sign in or sign up. And for this case, we'll quickly sign up and create an account. Once you click sign up, you'll be greeted by the main homepage. And this main homepage is basically where you first narrow down your search results by exploring which cuisine you would want. So in this case, after looking around, let's say we want to click on the French cuisine. Here is the list of chefs that are under the category of French cuisines. In this case, you can either scroll down and keep looking at the list of chefs, or you can use the filter. You can filter it by the date, by the time, or even by the amount of people first. In this case, say I select Chef Michel Berger. Once I click into this, it brings up to his profile. If you notice on the top right, there's also a heart icon. You can press this, and it will basically save it to the save tabs. This enables users to come back to their favorite chefs at a later time and click into his profile without having to go through their search results again. In this case, once we go through his profile and we look at his bio, we can also further 
click on the reviews to see the reviews of other users that have used his service before. Next, once we are satisfied that we want to go with him, we can click the view food course. From here, it will have his special unique food course that he designed to be serving you. From there, you can click to check his availability. From here, you can look through the months and the time. In this case, let's say we go for the 19th on June. We can select the date, and if we want a dinner time, we can select 5 p.m. Hit save. Once we hit save, we have the reservation summary page. This is where all the basic price info is displayed. Also, if you need to make any further changes, such as the date and time, you can change it here. And also the amount of people. After this, you can hit confirm. After hitting confirm, it brings you to the bookings confirmation page where you can access the upcoming and also past bookings page. But say in this case, after the chef has received your booking reservation, he can basically directly message you and you'll get a notification. If you click on this notification, it'll bring you to the inbox page. When in the, this inbox page, you can directly message him for things such as dietary restrictions or any special requests that you want. You can just send him a message here. After that, you can wait until your booking day comes and you will enjoy a nicely cooked dinner by Chef Michel Berger. And thank you for listening to my presentation. Great job. Okay, now we'll uh, hand it over to the reviewers uh, for feedback. Okay. I'm happy to jump in if, uh, if I can. Um, great presentation, um, uh, really great work. Um, I think it's a cool idea having uh, fine, fine dining on demand. Um, so I just have a, a couple of kind of uh, random questions and, and some points of feedback. Um, so kind of going along with your whole story, like I was understanding that you're basically, um, you're kind of co uh, collecting a, a lot of uh, great chefs to bring that experience that, uh, to someone's home. Um, I thought it was really interesting at the end though, um, after going through all of the, the different chefs um, and you're, you know, you're looking at them by, by reviews, by ratings, um, ultimately they have a prefixed menu that, that they're bringing to your home, right? I assume that that helps with, you know, the tools and the ingredients that they need to bring. Um, but it, it seems like you're ultimately making a selection based on the food, right? Because it, it's through the person, but if they're only offering one course, um, I wonder if there's another way to also like allow a different point of entry based on what you're hungry for. Um, then you're also being matched to the chefs that um, might prepare that kind of meal. So for example, if, um, you know, if you don't like seafood or you're allergic or whatever, and you need a different type of meal, um, you know, just being able to search by some type of maybe other, other pathway or other food um, meal options could then match you to those um, kind of pre-vetted chefs for whatever you envisioned, right? If um, I'm doing this for my wife for our anniversary and I know she really loves a specific type of Thai, thai cuisine, um, I might wanna kind of find that, um, but not necessarily through the, the person who I have to kind of read and, and validate um, uh, all of that feedback uh, to make sure that they're the right chef for that experience. Um, I think also you might have some opportunity to create a little more stickiness in the app. Like how would you bring, think about how you bring people back? Um, are there plans or a subscription or, right? Are you like building a, a relationship somewhat with, uh, with a chef that knows you and, and your dietary restrictions or um, just knows what you like to eat? Uh, you could also of course sample many different menus, but uh, I think there's just an opportunity, not just for a one and done, but once you find some chefs that are local that you like that, you know, um, uh, that you could kind of uh, bring people back a little bit easier. Um, and I would just say, I think the process is great overall. Um, I think in the beginning of your, of your work, um, it could be helpful where you had, um, you were kind of like mapping out the app flow and everything. Could be helpful just to see like, what are the primary and like, or like key goals that someone's trying to achieve in this app? And um, if it's the review of, or what are you trying to enable for them overall, right? Like, is it the review of chefs? Is it education, there's like a moment of education and kind of like managing their anticipation until the chef arrives or even just educating them to know like what's, what's kind of in scope for that meal. Don't worry, they'll come and bring all the tools that they need. They're gonna clean up everything. 
uh, and what do I have to do to prepare? Like just understanding those kind of like key goals uh, would help me kind of make sense of all the screens that you're showing and a lot of the great work that you were doing, just to kind of like bucket, bucket it a little more. Uh, great job. Thank you. Hey guys, I can jump in if that's cool. And we've, got um, about, we've got about two minutes, Alia, thank you. Oh, okay, I can be fast. Um, that was great, thanks. I think kind of in line with what Mark was saying around setting up user um, goals and the primary interactions here, I thought what could be really helpful at the beginning of your presentation is just doing a text-based user flow of all of the steps that someone might go through in a happy path so that it's really clear for the user what they're looking at and what you hope to achieve in your designs. Um, I thought otherwise, I had a few other more granular pieces of feedback for your UI. So I noticed there were, I think, five tabs. Um, your app concept is great, but it's also fairly simple. So I wonder if your app concept really needs that amount of tabs. So when you're thinking about tabs, you can also think about the concept of primary interactions or like more secondary interactions. Maybe something like an inbox could be an entry point through something like a profile or account or somewhere else a little bit less primary if you anticipate there will be less usage, but that's just something to think about. I think just in terms of visual design, thinking about the weight of the fonts that you used is also something you could take a look at. I noticed that the fonts that you're using were pretty light. So you want to think about legibility when you're designing apps, um, also the concept of accessibility. So um, one way you could think about accessibility also is through the use of color, right? So if you're using a white font against a gray background, there are a lot of online accessibility checkers that if you haven't, just do a quick run through and just make sure that your contrast ratios are high enough so that people who are colorblind are still able to use your app. Um, also, just in terms of the patterns that you used, I noticed that there were two calendar pickers. When you're building a simple app like this, you might want to consider condensing your patterns down to like one type of pattern. So if you have a calendar picker, consider using one and that will make it quicker for your development team to build it because they're only using one pattern instead of two. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say just in terms of like really granular uh, visual design feedback is that the active state of your tabs is kind of light. So if I get back to a tab after like an interaction flow and then I see that I bounce to another tab, it's harder for me to notice that because the contrast of the active tab versus like the inactive tab isn't super high. So maybe just consider bumping up the contrast ratio there. But otherwise, great job. Thank you very much for feedback. Okay, great. And we'll have to move on. Um, I just want to mention also that we have a spreadsheet for the reviewers to put uh, written feedback as well. So Ben, you'll get into some, possibly getting some written feedback as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Okay, and we'll hand it over now to Jen and Varun. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Ma, and this is Varun Narayan Swami, and we are the creators of StoryGlow. StoryGlow is a mobile application that expands the imaginative world of storytelling and play into any physical space. So I want you guys to imagine that it's story time, and you're reading a story to a young child. And the story that you guys are reading is a pirate adventure and you want to emulate the setting or the environment of that story in the room around you. StoryGlow will let you do this with sound effects and light control, and we're going to show you a quick example of this. It was twilight, and you're deep in the Amazon rainforest, when suddenly a splash, and a little pirate appears. He tells you to go and to explore the treasures in the Cave of Wonders. And when you arrive, it's pitch black. The captain strikes a match and shows you the treasures of the world. So as you guys, as you guys can see from this video, StoryGlow will allow, allow you to add immersion and interaction to any story time and also emulate this setting in the room around you. So to use StoryGlow, there's a few products that you're going to want to have. The first is the LIFX color changing light bulb. The next is the StoryGlow application downloaded. And finally, a Bluetooth speaker. 
Although we have a number of different features, we would like to highlight the ability to record unique sound effects to really encapsulate the environment you're trying to create in any physical space. You'll be using the, a simple tap and your iPhone microphone to record these sounds. You'll also be able to instantaneously change your environment of your room with a click of a button by clicking different colors on our color wheel to mimic whatever setting you're trying to emulate. So our intent with this project was to make a customizable tool that added interaction and immersion to the experience of storytelling and with that increased reading comprehension and the enjoyment of stories. When we were first getting into this field and space, we wanted to do some research and see what currently existed. The field of interactive and immersive storytelling is by no means a new field, so we were able to find a lot of resources that were very helpful. The first was this project called Story Rooms, conducted by the University of Maryland in 2000. This project was similar to StoryGlow, but instead of using a mobile application with light control and sound effects, it had the kids building their own immersive and interactive props that they used while telling stories. This project was great for us because it confirmed for us that what we were doing would actually work as these kids showed increases in both reading comprehension and enjoyment. Another project that we wanted to touch on was the integrative, Integrating Interactive Learning Experiences into Augmented Toy Environments project conducted by the University of Zurich in 2007. This project used a night toy kit along with some RFID tools to make music and other interactive noises to add to this uh, immersive story. And kids were extremely focused during this, pres during this experience and also seemed to really enjoy it. After we conducted our initial research, we started user testing with a simple paper prototype. We then moved on to create a digital mock-up of our application to test the modality of how this would feel on an actual mobile device. We wanted to test things like long presses, swipe gestures, etc. Then our last test we did with a younger audience to gauge how they would actually use our application. Because this will be an experience not only for adults, but to be creating stories with your children. Along with our prototypes, we also wanted to do a proof of concept, along with our research, to prove that what we were doing would actually work. We went to the Boulder Ball Vihar and told two stories to them. The first, we just simply read, and the second story we read, but we added in sound effects as well. We found that kids enjoyed the, sound, the story with sound effects much more and were also far more focused. We then moved on to creating some proof of concepts. On the left here, you can see us starting to develop our light control features. Then on the right, you can start to see our development of adding in different sound searching utilities for our sound API. And after doing all of this prototyping and user testing, it was time to get into actual Swift development. We spent about 50% of our semester on the actual development of the application not only creating nice our, the UI that we decided on, uh, as you can see here, we have our list of potential stories and scenes. We have our actual uh, UI of each scene that you would be using in your StoryGlow project along with your recording page, but a seamless UI that allows people to set up their StoryGlow projects to use alongside their story time. Overall, through all of our prototyping and development, we're extremely proud to present StoryGlow. And we can see a number of different use cases. You could be imagining that this would be used for Dungeons and Dragons, a quick bedtime story, or just to entertain your children. StoryGlow is a mobile application that allows adults alongside children to create interactive and immersive story sets corresponding to any story that of your choosing with a few click of a buttons. Thanks. Do you guys have any questions? Great job. All right, handing it over to the pan to the reviewers. It's super fun, y'all. Um, the the process and kind of all the things you're showing me are were really interesting. Um, the use cases that you touched on at the very end were really helpful. Um, and I wonder even if you could have brought those a little earlier on. Um, like the the tool you've created is very flexible and usable for many different things, which is totally cool. Um, but 
met, like, as I was going, I kept thinking like, oh, you're kind of talking about kids. And then you, then you kept showing pictures of adults. And I was thinking like, wait, who's the user group here? And like, what's the setup necessary? Um, like, I think the tool facilitated all, any of those things and even posi positioning it as like a very wide usage with like two very diverse user groups might've like helped me go through the story a little more concretely. Um, like I liked seeing all of the interface um, and I would have loved to even see more there. And I think understanding a little bit um, of positioning also of it's somewhat related to the user idea of like what the setup process is and who that person is setting it up and like the amount of work necessary to do that storytelling. Like, is that a pro or a con? Like in the Dungeons and Dragons, like example, like it totally makes sense. Like it's all about storytelling and developing that yourself. But maybe as a parent, like it might be super annoying to have to like, as someone who has, has an almost four year old, like the amount of time that's like, I can't imagine it. So like, but if it's like a library, like I just, I wonder like there might be a balance there in the type of setup you're doing. Um, and then the idea of the required products also um, I was into and is somewhat about positioning. It's like, is this thing a product ultimately that like I'm supposed to like buy the complete set of to be able to do or is it like an open source thing that like anyone can install and then set up themselves? Like either again, totally fine. I just didn't like, I can imagine both in my brain as you were walking through it and just knowing like where you wanted to position it might be really helpful as you're talking about it. Cool, thank you so much. Yeah. I could uh, just piggyback on, on some of those. Um, great projects are really cool to see it um, come to life. But um, yeah, just to piggyback on some of those thoughts, um, right away when you open, like I saw this as like a package set. So I'm like, cool, this is, what's the like, the value prop with that? It's like, you know, like story time remade or whatever it is, right? But you're making like parents' lives easier if that's like the group you're going after and it's just gonna be helpful. Um, I think the user group comment that you mentioned, Drew, was. Uh, spot on um, because there, there's quite a bit of like uh, setup that that is involved so when you think about those specific groups some might be more willing to set up than others right for the ultimate Dungeons and Dragons atmosphere versus that busy parent so if you know who that user is I wonder if there are ways that are, are they able to like download pre-made sets is it based on the types of stories your kids like are there like you know the captain story the, the the pirate story that you mentioned, like there could be pre-made scenes with those lights and those sound effects pre-packaged. Um, I wonder if you could even also take it a step farther. Are there key phrases that the audio that you could recognize over audio that you don't? It wouldn't require someone reading a story at the same time to orchestrate the light scenes on their phone. Like, can you bring voice into that as well? Um, just to you know, because it's a lot to manage a kid and a book and and the devices and you know um, the lighting choreography. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think um, overall awesome to see and really cool work. Thank you, you so much. So much. Um, quick comments piggybacking off of both of those comments. Um, I thought that, yeah, choosing a user group will really help simplify the interactions that you're choosing, I think. Um, as the other two reviewers said, I think once you choose a user group, providing more of a guided interaction, I think would be helpful. So. You could think about this like if it's for story time, you could also think about tools that already exist that you could just integrate with your app. So something that comes to mind really quickly is like, could you do like an Audible or Kindle integration here? Um, that way the story is provided, it's less work up front for the user, and then you can just like find a way to automate the cues of your lighting and sound effects so that like it becomes like a pre-made story that I don't have to do any additional work for. But Otherwise, I thought it was a really cool idea. Great job. Thank Thanks. you so much. Fantastic. Really great job. Development you did too. Okay, great job. And uh, now we'll hand it over to May. Hi. So hi everyone, my name is Yame Liao. With other in interview I did last semester for Capstone, like augmented reality stuck in my mind. It's quite interesting to me, and I think it's one of the fast development technology that will probably widely use in the future. So for my Capstone, I decided to experiment with the technology AR and implementing it for board games, specifically for Catan.
So Catan AR is a series of proof of concept augmented reality board game experiments, which integrating laser cutting, augmented reality, and traditional board game elements together to provide a richer game experiments for the next generation of board game player. So there are some existing AR board game. The newest one probably is the Tube 5 hologram gaming system. Projection is the main technique that they are using. And there are another one called the Last Game Board, which is a gaming tablet having a sense screen and some smart 3D elements that are physical objects. So, but however, I want to do something different. I'm aiming at applying AR for the traditional board game in a way that allow most of people get access to it with not only AR glasses, but with already on devices like cell phone or iPad. So how is mailing going to work? After some research, I figured out how it might work is that uh, with AR platform services, which will enable me to upload the 3D models I made and match them with the 2D QR code, or we can call it like image trackers. So then through the device like cell phone, iPad, et cetera, user can have an interactive and collaborative visual experience with board game. Then I starting uh, content terrain sketches and some prototyping for the model. And then I move on to directly modeling um, those terrains in Maya. Modeling was uh, does affect a lot of my project. One reason is that most of the platform don't support building 3D models within their program, but will have limitations and requirements of the 3D models. The other reason is that there are a lot of 3D modeling programs that supports different file format and works slightly differently. I didn't try out um, multiple modeling tools. I did on my modeling Maya. See, and then move on to all the different AR tools. Um, since I, since AR is a brand new technology to me, I did research and tried out the later on five existing AR platform. The first one is the A-Frame School. Uh, it's a nice platform that allow everyone with a device that support AR function have the access to it with the web link they provide, but it has its own requirement about model. For more complex, it requires GLTF format and in order for texture and animation to work, you require to convert the GLTF file to GLB file and some with some additional web link source. However, uh, since I built my model at first all in Maya, uh, I had a lot of trouble like converting my Maya model file into those previous two file that required. And I got um, trouble finding nice documentation about custom QR code set for the augmented reality. So I then switched to the next program, um, which is Unity. I um, Unity seems like to have a lot of online resources with AR topic. Uh, a lot of those are related, uh, but my experience with Unity isn't super pleasant. A lot of those resources are related to a plugin called Euphoria, which being updated and changed a lot during the time. In this case, a lot of tutorial uh, and documentation I find before 2018 not working on my version of Unity that are like 2020 right now. It's not working with Unity that are version 2019 or later. So. For me, I was able to implement it on my Maya file and figure out the format, texture, and image tracker for it, for those models. But in order to make it work on an iOS device, I still need to work with the Xcode later on. The good thing with it is that people can make their own AR application, but the problem is the Unity Preview Xcode program isn't support since iOS 10. So it requires this amount of knowledge of programming in Xcode. Then I move on to the other program called ROAR. It can use any type of clear image and photos as their image tracker. That's their one main advantage, but it only works with OBJ file. So you might lose some detail of the 3D modeling and 
for me, for my experiments, the 3D model that I built doesn't show up really nice through this program. So the next program I tried is called Eco AR. Uh, it's pretty similar to the previous program, but it doesn't require downloading their own app. Instead, it will provide a web link just like the A-Frames group. Um, but it support FBX files, so it keep, it's better at keeping detail of those 3D model. So that's the good thing of it. But the only problem I have is the camera recognition for a customer complex a little bit complex image tracker doesn't work super well. Then finally, I moved to the Augment AR, which I had the best experiment with. It also has its own iOS application. It works with OBJ file. And with this method, I was able to approach my original idea for program even without image tracker. So here's the final look for it. So user, after placing all the 3D model, they could play the board game then. So through all the research, I figured out that even AR came out years ago, but it's such a powerful tool still in the fast developing process. Changing like happens rapidly and requires advanced technology to support it. Like the image tracker was once essential for sharing and anchoring. 3D models, but with more advanced technology and device came out, the tracker doesn't, is, um, it's not necessary anymore. And here are some laser cutting parts of the project. And that's it. Thank you, everyone. Do you guys have any questions? I thought this was awesome. Um, just a really quick comment. I thought that when you started this presentation, like maybe it would have been really powerful to see just like a quick snapshot of your final result. So that like me as the viewer, like I would get, like this is super exciting, right? Like AR is like a fairly new technology and the result you were able to create was awesome. But yeah, I thought just like showing a quick snapshot of the final result and the even the proposed interaction with the phone would have been like very helpful to frame this presentation, but otherwise, great job. Yeah, May, I really enjoyed some of your work. Um, something that I really liked that I would have loved to even for you to show us a little more of were like your initial sketches with a hand drawn, like the pencil sketches looked really beautiful, um, like of each tile that you were considering um, and really just kind of made me think about just the, like the storytelling or like scenic kind of implication, like possibilities of each tile, which I think is honestly what you ended up exploring the most. Like you were you were working through the technology and the interactions, but like the part that was more striking to me or more interesting was like how each piece in this 3D space like told a more complex story through the gameplay than you would have had otherwise. Um, and seeing a little more of that arc would be really cool because I feel like that's actually where your brain is working. Like you did a lot of work thinking about like the little sheep and like the wheat and like that stuff is actually really lovely. Um, and seeing like why you thought of each of those things and the story you were trying to tell with that and how that changes or enhances the gameplay would be really cool to hear about. Um, the other thing that I wanted, well, number one, AR is super hard. <laughs> so any experimentation, incredibly uh, impressive to me. Like I worked, um, with a team, the team that makes AR storytelling at the New York Times, like the, on the newsroom side, we built the tools to help them do that. And um, that was really, really hard to do, number one. Um, and it's even fallen apart on Android. It only works on iOS right now. Don't tell anyone. Um, but number two, um, something that I also found with AR, like just watching their like storytelling evolve as um, like a, a newsroom group, was that some of the work that ended up being much the, the most effective work that I've seen them do. It got simpler and simpler over like the stories that they did. Like my fate went, well, number one, they just did a, a piece, but I don't know if you saw about like the six foot radius of like a sneeze and like why the six foot matters. And so they like, they demonstrated that, but in very simple ways, just like little droplets. Um, but like one of my most 
uh, the most impactful pieces I think they did was when the boys were caught in the, the Thai cave. Um, and so like the entire piece was just holes. Like it was a black sheet and then like a tiny thing and that like of different sizes and that kind of storytelling, like the simplicity of that in that space is actually what made it the most effective. So I also think like you could play with like that idea. Like I feel like some of the visuals like are what you're playing with the most there um, and kind of thinking through like the simplest way to be the most effective in the storytelling would be really interesting for you to keep playing with. Thank you. Um, I'll just I'll just layer in just super quickly. Uh, I don't know Catan and I don't know AR, so I can't really comment there. Um, but from like your UI and just like overall what you're doing, I, I think it's a really cool idea and great to experiment with. Um, the the end result that you showed, like think about that um, how how what you're designing lives in the like in the real world, and some of that UI that you had was obstructing the behaviors that people were doing like on the board. So think about like how those coexist. Um, and right again, like like uh, Drew mentioned, like how does it build on and, and reinforce what you're doing, um, but not necessarily obstruct or replace it because um, you're still controlling it, right? Um, and just overall, uh, you know, I'm coming at this from like overall like user experience perspective. Um, it's great seeing the experimentation and what the tech could do, but I would just uh, say don't, ever let the tech lead you. Um, there are limitations and there are going to be dependencies and even just the learning curves. Uh, I think if you were showing process overall, I would have loved to have gotten like a bird's eye view just to compare. Here's everything that I looked at and maybe it's like um, understanding like your requirements that you were looking for. Just like what are the must-haves, the nice-to-haves. Here's a quick test of the capabilities or just you know when you're like evaluating software, you're just trying to even see like is there docu is it well documented or is there a community out there like those are huge things when you're working on this before your capstone project like you know you're up late and you're like crap i need to figure out how to do this thing um those are like the types of real world decisions that you make because you need to know if this is like uh like a documented thing or there's going to be support for you um but it could have been cool to like see that at a bird's eye view um before you maybe committed I, I don't know how much time you committed to each of those investigations and explorations um but it could have also helped maybe um you know unnecessary time spent um but i think where you got to overall was really cool and i agree with drew like i'd love to see more of the like the storytelling elements come out because you did put um some good thought into that and then it seemed like you were just like going more into like the tech driven world after that and the story elements didn't really kind of come you didn't sew that all the way through and i think there's an opportunity for that so great job thank you all right thank you so much may okay we're going to hand it over now to kathy and brooke Okay, my name is Kathy, and this is Brooke. Yeah, oh, sorry, yeah. this is Brooke. Uh, and we noticed that for students, college can be a really stressful time, especially when midterms start rolling in. And for some, it can be so overwhelming that they fall behind. There's a lot of productivity apps out there, but few address the emotional aspect of motivate or of work motivation. Meet Mochi, our guide dog. He'll help users with various tasks and reward them for being productive. Our method of motivation was to create a source of emotional motivation, and we figured the best way to do it was through a cute pet. This is the result of our productivity app. Mochi will help users break the task down, setting a timer, and providing rewards if the user was, uh, was productive. We did similar research on other platforms. Our first example is Forest. It was a timer that had you do a task and gave you a little tree to grow. If you closed the app to go on a different website, you kill the tree. But if you finished, you'd be able to plant a real life tree. You're being productive and saving the world at the same time. Habitica is similar and it was gamifying productivity. We found out for some users, the concept of an RPG could be a turn off. Sometimes there's confusing jargon and the way they set up can be too strict for the user. We like the idea of making productivity fun and engaging, and also the concept of having a pet as well. In the early phase of our project, we created a prototype in ActionRP. This was an interactive, cl clickable prototype that allowed us to quickly test our features and get user feedback on it. You can see that it's very low fidelity from here. 
We were mainly testing how we broke down tasks and our approach to helping users be productive. Here you can see that we're determining what kind of task this is so we can break it down further. In user testing, we realized that this might be hard if we had a task that was simple but long. We made changes to terminology that was based on complexity instead of length. So I just wanted to do a quick overview of our um, application stack. Um, we ended up using Vue.js as our front end, and we also ended up using this JavaScript library called Workbox, which um, helped us install a service worker and um, basically make our website a progressive web app. And we've been using Postgres and Node for our backend. So some of our challenges that um, for, for development was just learning how to use the Workbox library, also um, implementing authentication, and just trying to structure our data in the database so it was uh, easy to read and write. After our prototyping and testing phase, we, um, we moved on to the high fidelity layout. You can see how it resembles the prototype, but has the addition of colors, typography, and other styles. This is our first iteration. And as we designed, we gathered feedback and came up with the final iteration. Mochi's illustrations have finally been uh, fine-tuned, and we've changed our user interface so that it's more friendly. We also added priority coloring for our tasks, so we know so the user knows what to uh, what to prioritize and what to not. For the UX challenges, we learned that not to let the, the theme of the project overpower the UX. Uh, we need to be conscious of feature creep because we had a lot of ideas that we want to implement, but not exactly the resources or time. We also learned that we can't fix the user if they're unmotivated. Hopefully, if they are, they're able to have our app as a resource, as a support, and as a useful tool for their productivity. So this is actually just a demo of the final project. Um, people can just uh, add tasks, and then they can further break them down into bytes and nibbles if they feel like the task is too big and they just need to um, simplify it and then it gets added to their dashboard where people can then work on the task for a set amount of time. Um, it's 25 minutes by default, but users can change the amount of time they want to work on things in their, uh, in their settings. And since we've decided to make our website a progressive web app, users can install it from the browser. And this kind of enables native, uh, it, it allows the app to basically behave like a, a native application. So it looks like an app and you can download it onto the home screen of your phone. And we just thought it would be a nice touch for um, users to be able to use this on their phone or on, on their computer. And so overall, we aim to create a simple, straightforward experience to help people record tasks and just to provide a structure to encourage them to begin working on tasks. And we invite you to visit it at the URL listed below. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Do you go back to the URL so I can actually- Oh yeah, it? sorry. <laughs> sorry. I want, I, it look, it's so cute. I have to play with it. Thank you. <laughs> Oh yeah, you should totally start. This is your, this is your jam. Yeah. Hey guys. Um, so I've worked on a few products that incorporate a lot of illustration. So when I saw this, I was like, yay, I love it. I want to use it immediately. <laughs> um, Thank you. Yeah, so I thought this was great. I thought the brand um, elements that you're using throughout your UI were pretty cohesive. Um, I thought because like you already have like the makings of like a brand, UI, you could potentially lean into that a little bit more. So examples would be, so the Nibble logo is in that like fatter type, maybe get the lead copy is also that fatter type to create like a consistency or it's like a slightly different weight of that font. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that like the rounded serif that you're using here works, but you know, like you could play into those brand elements a little bit more. Um, I'm sorry if I missed it, but was there user testing included in this? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, okay. So otherwise, I thought the value prop was super clear. Um, you showed task creation. I thought that was great. In terms of UX, I thought that everything was clear, but I would have loved to see another way to navigate back from pages. So I noticed that clicking a CTA was the only way to say like, hey, I'm done, navigate back to what I'm assuming would be a previous state. But maybe you think about including fried crumbing on the page or like some other UX mechanism to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I thought just in terms of like task creep, you're right, as I was looking at this, I could imagine like a bunch of other things being integrated into this. One thing that I thought you could potentially think about was that the ideas of like green, orange, red, like they're pretty recognizable as like go, no go, or like stalled as statuses, but um, I think if you're thinking about color and color palette, like you could do some testing around that to see if like your assumptions around are these recognizable, is that a correct assumption? Um, and then in terms of additional features, you could think about the idea of customizing that color palette. Something that came to mind when I was looking at this was Trello. I think there are a lot of similarities between the Trello product and what you're creating here. Um, but the integrations of those customizations, um, you could take a look at that if you're looking for inspiration. Um, and yeah, otherwise I thought it was great. Love the design, thought it was super cute. Great job, guys. Thank you. I could jump in. Um, I think, uh, yeah, great job overall. Uh, I love the, you know, I was looking for a new method to, to kind of manage the, the tasks, uh, all the tasks out there. So um, I really like the, Kind of like the motivating factor that you started out with and i was curious um if or and or why that got killed but i you mentioned something about a tree that if you closed your browser like you saw it growing and there was like okay there's some purpose to that animation and i was like trying to you know keep feeding the tree and then it, was there like a real tree being planted if i actually grew it successfully like i thought that was like really cool um just to have that um that interaction um and, and I kind of lost that. So I don't know if that was replaced by the dog ultimately, but um, besides like the dog just kind of like softening uh, what's a very like functional and like task, task driven uh, activity, um, it didn't provide that same utility. Um, and it's okay, it could just be like more of like the brand and the UI element, but um, I, I think you could have gotten more out of that dog and like what it was doing based on, I don't know, maybe they're, you're showing more uh, success states or when you, you know, check things off, um, that's like a really celebratory moment and it's encouraging you. Um, but maybe like lean into that, uh, to the brand, um, like Alia mentioned as well. Um, you could, you know, you have the space for it. Um, also, uh, I think the UI, when it comes to the color, um, there was like a discrepancy for me because um, like the green, red, orange usually are like signals of like, like um, that, you know, confirmation or there's an error or something. And it was, I think, I'm not sure if I got this right, but I think it was linked to if it was a bite snack or meal. Um, but when I looked at those cards, I didn't get a sense of, oh, this is a bite. And maybe there's iconography that you could bring into it. Or um, I just lost a sense of that scoping mm -hmm. and like the task urgency. Like, um, yeah, you just didn't carry that metaphor all the way through. And I think you could do more with that if that's like your organizing principle for, um, or, or actually you should also test this, like, is that conceptual model resonating with people? And is that how they think about organizing their tasks? Um, yeah. But I think the color and the iconography could be, um, could gel a little bit more and it would be like super solid. Um, but love the idea overall, bring back the tree because I think that's really cool. Thank you. Yep. The only things I'll throw out are just from a storytelling standpoint. Well, I feel, I, I feel like the, the partnership between you two is incredibly strong. And I, I think, um, like, I don't know if you split up the development and design work, but it worked, it just got you really far and complete within like your conceptualization and your implementation. And so um, that came across really strongly in your story. And ultimately when you're talking about this, like in a portfolio or anything like that's gonna be really nice to talk about, like how you learned so much about working with the other discipline and how that challenged you or got you further. I also think like the way you summarize both your technical learnings and challenges and your UX learnings and challenges were really smart. Um, like, you know, uh, 
PWA is really hot right now and like playing with that was fun, but it didn't like overwhelm like the, like it was just like a mechanism for delivering this thing. So it was cool. And we got to learn about that, but it didn't become like the entire story. Same thing with the UX things. Like, you know, do you, you hit on like these major things that really like I could see them reflected, like the idea of it not overwhelming um, and the feature group, like those are like real things that we all think about every day when we're building products. So it's really nice to see you like articulate those things and then tie them back. Um, like Ollie was saying, I think you did have some um, prototyping insights and you could call those out a little stronger. Like, I think you were saying that like you learned about how to um, uh, size things based on your prototyping and it would be really great to see like the before and after because that kind of learning and your ability to articulate that in a context like that is again, I'm in a portfolio sense, like what we'd want to see, like if you were like, at coming to interview for a job, be like, oh yeah, this human actually understands how to talk about this stuff with other humans. Like, I should hire them. So, like, showing that stuff is really smart. Uh, it's really nice. And if that me. if that's even mapped out, it could be interesting to bring your your project to it, right? Like, what are the development tasks that were a bite, snack, or a meal? And like, there's that relative scaling. But like, you know, you'll you'll have t-shirt sizing or cards, or they're all different mechanisms for doing that. But even to like own that part of it could be really cool. I was actually, while you were talking, Drew, I was thinking like, did you even use this app to track the design and development work that you were, that you were, you know, that you knew that each other had to do? Um, but I think that just kind of like could bring it full circle and you're actually showing how like you have an, a working prototype and you were even able to use it in the management of the work that you had to do. Um, but yeah, awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, great, great job, good job. Okay, and so next we will move to Israel. Hey guys, can you hear me? All right. All right, so hi everybody. Uh, my name is Israel and my project is DiveFind. Uh, DiveFind is a native iOS app that allows users to find dishes from restaurants nearby based on the specific diet that they follow. So imagine you follow a keto diet. You are working and forgot to pack a lunch for the day. So you realize you have to eat out. You don't really know any keto friendly dishes you could order. So you're stuck between choosing to stay hungry, breaking your diet, and in some cases, <clears throat> even getting sick if you follow the diet for specific health reasons. This is where diet find comes in. Diet find solves the issue by providing dishes tailored to those diets from restaurants close by. Now I know what you're thinking. This is just another dieting app, but diet find is different. If we look at other apps that are out there, we find two main types of apps. The first being a food tracking app. The most popular of these is MyFitnessPal. Um, MyFitnessPal allows users to track the food they eat, but not find new food. Um, another category of app are restaurant finder apps, the most popular being Yelp. Now Yelp allow, allows users to find restaurants based on location and filters, but not specific dishes from those restaurants. Uh, the first step in the process of building Diet Find was user testing. I began with a paper prototype of a few different ideas of the app and tested these, these with users. Um, I found that most users like the simplicity of a car card based layout. I then moved to a higher fidelity XD wireframe that allowed me to test the user experience and flow of the app with user interactions and different screens. I found a lot of valuable information about what users like, but one thing that stood out was that users loved the app to be simple and straightforward without so many screens or confusing buttons or navigation. From the te technical side, I tested out a few different restaurant APIs, but found the most reliable and complete to be the Nutritionix API, which I used to get the restaurant and dish data for my app. I also used an open source UI library by Ramotion to help me create a simple but powerful user interface. These two components combined with Xcode 
and a lot of Swift code allowed me to come to my final product. So I'm gonna play this video for you guys. You would first launch the app. Um, in the main screen, you choose your diet and tap the search button. The app will then use your phone's GPS location and the API to find restaurants near you. You can easily scroll through the app and tap on any restaurant to get a full list of the dishes that match your diet. In this case, being keto dishes. Additionally, you also have the option to call or get directions from restaurants inside each of the cards. And that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, hand it over for uh, reviewers. Um, I thought this was great. Uh, I had a few comments. So um, I think when you're presenting the problem, this type of problem, I think, could be made more powerful if you connect it to how it relates to you. So when you're presenting um, you know, a pitch like this or like a final presentation, you could think about just like the narrative structure of your presentation. Overall, I thought you did really well in this, but if you're presenting like a problem, I thought it would be really powerful to say like, hey, I'm keto and like, this is why I need this app and this is why it's a big problem. Um, so basically personalize the story to draw me in a little bit more. Uh, in terms of your user testing results, I thought the way you presented that slide, this is really granular feedback, but when I'm looking at a slide, um, I think you just had like something really simple that just said user testing results, actually like bullet out like what those test results are for me. So that me as the user, I automatically grok like basically what your results were and I connect with that as you're telling the story. Um, also in terms of user testing, I thought the paper prototyping was great, but I was wondering if you had any other uh, form factors of UI that you tested with. Um, I think generally seeing like comparative user testing is powerful because then it shows you like the results you were trying to achieve were better achieved with um, option number two as opposed to option number one because of X, Y, and Z as opposed to I thought cards worked well um, and they did. Like it's great that they worked well and that's a known pattern, but if it's a known pattern, you might also want to talk about like like material design for Google, like uses cards a lot, like why are they successful for Google and like connect that back to your project to make the reason why you're using them a little bit more powerful. Um, and then just like granular UI feedback, I thought the UI was really nice. One piece of feedback I had is that like generally for search buttons, you don't, you might want to think about like known patterns for how other apps are doing search. So generally there's like a search bar with a search icon or a button with just like a magnifying glass in it that expands. So something to think about. Um, and then just in terms of your search results, I noticed that the distance away from you was treated as the most primary item in that list. So you had the brightest color behind it and it was the thing that popped out at me the most in what was like kind of a dense list. So I think that's totally fine. I would just make sure that if you are making something the most primary, like that becomes the most important piece of information that you want the user to see. Uh, and then just in terms of ordering, maybe consider it placing it on the left because users tend to read like left to right. So if distance is the most important, maybe that's the first thing they see. Uh, and then just consider the density of that information and how you present that visually because it was a lot for my eye to scan. But otherwise I thought the value prop was really clear and thought it was a cool tool. Great, thank you. I could jump in uh, quickly. Um, great job. I thought it, it was really cool to just see like beginning to end and just like a really tight focus on like the problem that you were solving. Um, and, you know, it's, I think it's easy sometimes when you have like a very, uh, a very well described um, uh, problem that you're like, you're acutely solving for. So you see how it helps like focus uh, your, your, your work. Um, I think simplicity overall is great. Obviously, something to aspire to. Um, I would say not at the sen not at the expense of um, some legibility. So I was making an assumption. Uh, I don't diet or anything, but I don't know. Are these pro users? Are these first timers? Like I didn't know specifically. Um, and if they're pro, maybe like are they super on their diet? Like always making sure to pack lunches. So where I'm going with that is um, the menu, the the diets that I selected, like. 
do you need to provide a little bit of context or education? Like you as an app, like you need to show some transparency. Is there some explainer of like, like, I don't know, are there different types of keto? Like when I click keto, like what standards or what are you looking for? What are the facets that you're then going to be searching and pulling from those APIs from, right? So like that, just something to think about, like, um, how are you categorizing meals that are Atkins, right? So um, this is just another question for you. I don't know if those APIs that you're pulling in um, data from the specific restaurants, I'm assuming they're not categorizing their meals by these diets. Like that's a layer that you're kind of putting in there, um, that editorialization, if you will. So I didn't get a sense of that. Like, okay, are you going personally through Applebee's menu and scraping it specifically for those five egg dishes that are keto or whatever. Like, I didn't get the sense of like, what are the facets that you're looking for? And how are you categorizing uh, those meals based on, is it is it a binary, like this is keto or not? Or is it like, this is a seven out of 10, at least it's getting you towards that keto goal, but it might have other parts of the dish that are not 100% what you're looking for but it gets you close to your goal. At least it's better than not eating at all. Um, another thing just altogether, like you're, I, I get that in the moment, distance is kind of like the main thing because you're looking for lunch right around you. So I wonder if there's a map view, like you should just be able to visually see like here, you know, it's just like a switch between like your list view and a map view. It's a pretty common convention. Um, and then I think from like a UI perspective, you could probably bring a little more light to it. It's like so, kind of task driven, um, but I wonder if there's just like some of the brand that you could inject in it or own it a little bit more, um, just that it's, you could still keep it super simple, but just like, you know, you could have a little bit more of a voice in that. Um, and I think, you know, from a UI perspective, um, uh, Alia hit on this point and I, I wrestled with like, okay, is, um, is, is distance the most important thing? Is the, how many keto dishes they have? Like what's most important to people? Is it just uh, how far they are from it because they got to get back to work after they get lunch or is it like the breadth uh, and variety of dishes that they can select from so like you had the elements I just the hierarchy seemed a little off like why is distance away from the address like should those two be more closely aligned um, but I think you had like the parts there and it could just like you know push like another like to finesse it a little bit um, and I think it could be like a really cool and useful thing uh, you know for people to have so um, yeah bravo great job Awesome feedback, thank you. The, the prototyping, um, like Ali was saying, was really nice to see like the output of that. And I think I think some of that finesse that is being mentioned and kind of the, the details on the digital side, like once you got to the digital side, could have been accomplished as well by doing some more prototyping with your digital interface and then just incorporating and talking about like what iterations that drove you to. So like it to like, I think really seal or like Take this project a little further it would be really nice just to like have that part of the storytelling as well and say like this is, and then i made this change and now it feels perfect and it's good um i assume that the diets uh like you'll have more diets available there but i wasn't sure about that and so like i mean it was very bolder that it was just keto and, and atkins is like your main ones um uh, but like I, I assumed but in any case um, the interface right now, like you do have to choose your diet every time. And I assume that probably most people like keep a diet for a very long time. So making that more like a default that then when they return, like it's just in that state probably makes enough sense. And then you can change that at a global setting level or some other way, since like you're probably going to keep that diet for a long amount of time might be worth um, considering. Um, and the, the other thing that I really was... Uh, that was resonating for me for what Mark was saying was just like maybe building out some like tr the, the trustworthiness of the, like your particular brand and what that means both in the positioning that's outside of your app, but also maybe inside of your app. It's like, why, why is your app so trustworthy? What's, what's yes. Like, why did you choose these things as Atkins or not? But then like con constantly like reemphasizing that so that this becomes like my trusted source of truth when I, want to make a decision like that. And so I built a relationship with you, your brand, your product, and I want to return to it often. Great, thank you. Okay, excellent job, Israel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, and we will move now to Fiorella. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Perfect. 
All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Fiorella Sobenes, and today I will be presenting my app, Planet. Planet is a calendar app for those who want an easy to use planning experience and want assistance to have productive free time. While considering making this app, I created three main goals. The first being having productive free time. I wanted to have this be a goal because I know that if it was up to me, I would have accidental endless free time and end up having a guilt of being unproductive. I also wanted to create one singular app to entail multiple already existing apps, such as the reminder and the calendar app. I personally don't like having to switch between multiple apps throughout my day, especially since they're all kind of related to self-organization. My last goal was to focus on simplicity. Crowdedness in apps is not something I personally enjoy looking at, especially when it has to do with organizing my day. I wanted to have an app that had enough white space for the user's eyes to be at ease, yet with enough content for the user to still be captivated. For my precedents, I wanted to start with the Galaxy Watch in activity reminders. They appear when the user has been inactive for a while as it recommends stretches or walks. However, I wanted to extend this idea for anything the user could and wanted to do in their free time, such as reading a book that had been sitting at home for a few months. Despite this being the main influence, I did not want the user to be able to deny it, as it is just a suggestion rather than pushing the user to do it. Next is simplicity. I love simple apps, and sometimes certain apps can seem a bit crowded and with a lot of screens. So, wanted this, my app to be pretty basic as well as very spacious. I have seen other calendar apps that are packed with information and with so many colors that I wanted to steer away from that, as well as keeping the white space and a minimalist color palette a priority. Lastly, I love the idea of Google Calendar reminders, but they don't ever notify me, so I end up forgetting what I wanted to do in the first place. Therefore, I wanted my app to have notifications and reminders to be at a specific time. And since I personally don't know what time I should be reminded of something, I wanted the app to assist me with this. Here is a preview of Planet. On the left is the to-do list. As one can see, the user is able to add any list item as well as a corresponding memo. The user then is able to check off the items if they have completed them and delete them if necessary. In the middle is the calendar view, where the user can keep it as is or can swipe upwards to make it into a weekly view. Each dot signifies a different event for the selected day. On the right is the intentions page, which is really what differentiates my app from other calendar apps in the market. Intentions are events the user would like to accomplish, but does not know when or does not, know, does not want to plan for it. The app then sees what day the user is free and inserts the intention on that day. For this app, the, if the user has four events or less or more, then it is considered busy. Planet will display a notification for the intention at 6.30 p.m. on the day of the intention. All tabs have a very similar and simple setting, as one can see. As mentioned before, I wanted to create an app that was not clustered and easy to read. When I began, I tried using JT Apple Calendar, but I switched early on to FS Calendar as the implementation was much smoother as well as the interface. There was also a translation difficulty between XD and Xcode as I was not able to match the aesthetics I originally wanted from my prototype to the actual product, such as the faded table of events and the color coding of the events in the calendar. However, I have been in communication with Wen Chao, who is the creator of FS Calendar, about changing the events dot colors to the colors that the user would like per event. As of now, they remain their standard blue color. I also decided to connect this calendar to the Apple Calendar, so that if the user decides to transition to Planet, they can do so without having to add all of their events at once and see their older events as well as their new ones in one place. The intentions are set to a specific time on the chosen day, as I have determined 
that that is when most people are both out of work and out of school. So I would love to do more research on this to ensure that all of the users are being notified at an appropriate time. I will now be demonstrating planets on a quick live demo. So first I wanted to start with a calendar view. As you can see, it is a standard calendar with monthly view and the events table below. The user here can swipe up and see other events. To add an event, simply press the plus button and here you can add the title of the event, the memo of the event, as well as the time that the event begins. Next, I want to switch to the intentions tab. Here, the user can have all of their intentions in one place. To add an intention, the same steps are followed. Add a title and a memo. Once the intention is saved, the user can check immediately in the calendar and check what day will be added. So since the previous days already have four events, the next free day would be the 30th on that Thursday, and thus the intention will be added then. Finally, I will switch to the to-do list. Immediately, you can notice that the um, circles are a bit bigger than those in the intentions. This signifies that the user is able to click on them to notify when they have finished an action. One can add it again in the same way that we have been able to add previous things before with a title and a memo. If the memo ends up being too long, the user can always click on it and a full description will appear. Thank you, I hope you enjoyed my project. Um, very fun. Um, I feel like my mental health and my therapist might have lots of things <laughs> to say about productive free time. Um, and so <laughs> uh, that's, a, that, that's, that's outside of the scope of this. Um, I mean, I definitely like, there is something lovely that you're playing with about this idea of like, we all miss out um, on like, we feel so overloaded out like in our free time that then like we have these ideas of grandeur of like which are not even that big of like reading that one book my friend told me about or cross stitching or whatever and then like we just completely lose our ability to accomplish those things and so carving out and finding some way to systematize or randomize that to like encourage it like that is like like the core of what you're working with is really really lovely um like I think balancing that with some of just like the actual implementation that you had to work through and like really building it out, which is also like impressive, like ultimately like might be slightly at odds with what you're trying to accomplish there. Um, but like the core of it, I definitely agree with it. I think understanding your users or like the types of users in the world, like calendaring is really complex because like everyone needs a calendar in the world. Um, so like, I mean, on an average day, I probably have, uh, 25 meetings on my calendar, for example. And so like, I would literally never get any of your things. I mean, they're all packed between like eight and, you know, eight, and then I get my free time, but then I've got kids, blah, blah, blah. So like understanding like the types of people and like the settings that would allow for this serendipity, I think is nice. The intentions idea and it being separate from do, do, to do is really nice, but so, but it would be really nice to be a little more intentional, I think about like, how much you're exposing or hiding from the user like you were saying okay and now you can go see where that thing got scheduled and it's like well is that good or bad like should i be able to see that on the intentions tab on the intentions tab should it be by category so that i like some things will take forever and some things are fast and but like how much of that matters and how much can you like push the serendipity so that mm -hmm. then like it's more about me just like discovering that in a moment or not having to think about it ever again. So maybe that stuff just like completely evaporates and then just appears when it's appropriate or like uh, there's just a little more there, but definitely like the kernel of what you're working with is really nice and what you've been able to implement is very impressive. Thank you. Yeah, I thought this was great. Um, I had a few comments to piggyback off what Drew was saying. I think task implementation would become really important with a productivity app and that concept. So there are a few frameworks that you could take a look at um, to maybe pad out this concept a little bit more. Something I immediately thought of uh, that I've heard a lot about recently is the idea of like the Pomodoro method. So the idea that you're focusing 
I think like 20 or 30 minutes on like more bite-sized aspects of tasks so that mm-hmm. they like mentally become more accomplishable or you feel like they are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Otherwise I thought that, um, again, getting around the concept of overscheduling is something that I think maybe you could look at a little bit more. Otherwise I thought like the personalization of this product was great, but I think like in that you could expand that and say like, okay, well, if I'm my main target audience um, or user group, what are the elements that make up my demographic? So I'm like 18 to 22, I'm a college student. Uh, is this for college students only? Uh, do they live in cities? Do they live in more rural areas? And from that, you could collect a more, um, just like a more cohesive user group and then like do some testing and then validate some of those thoughts that you had initially about like why you were creating this product. Um, I was wondering, I thought the dot elements of the UI were interesting. I would have loved to see a hover state of what it looked like when I like tapped on one of those elements. Like, is it just related to the list below? Is there a custom piece of UI related to that? I thought that could help in terms of explain, explaining the interaction. Um, I think also just to comment on the colors that you were choosing, I think there's something like nice about a gray palette but when you're thinking about interaction design sometimes it relates into like wireframe territory so I think uh creating like a richer gray palette if you're going to go in that direction is something to think about like how do I lighten up those grays provide more contrast again thinking about accessibility and overall design um and I thought that the concept of intentions was a little bit hard to understand as a user um like I got it as you were talking about it but in terms of the integration into the UI itself. Uh, I like the idea of subtle differences, but if you're integrating like two main concepts, I would think about differentiating those a little bit more. So for me, assume that I have never used this app before. I don't know what the concept of intentions means. How do you differentiate that visually? And then how can you clear me, clearly show me that they're different in a list? And then I was wondering, uh, what the interaction was in terms of how they get integrated into my overall list and showing that a little bit more I thought would have been great but otherwise I thought this was really cool oh one last comment <laughs> great blur UI comment um so the popover that you showed to show the task itself that UI style is typically used for an alert so something like turn on location settings or something like that so if you're using a popover modal think about differentiating um, like the height maybe, like typically popover modals are a little bit taller uh, so that they look a little less like system alerts mm-hmm. that lead into like OS level alerts. Uh, so yeah, otherwise, great job. Thank you. I don't know if we're out of time. I kind of dork it out on calendar and task integration stuff. I'd love to give comments. I'm also happy to write it just to keep us on schedule. So let me know. If, uh, we, have, we have plenty of time. We do, okay. Um, Cool. Great job. I love seeing um, investigation into this area. Um, one quick thing just before I get into it. Uh, initially on in your goal slide, um, you set up just goals and um, sometimes we would like differentiate between like business goals and user goals. I know you're kind of like the business and the user, but mm-hmm. um, trying to tease out a little bit more of like what are you trying to accomplish and like what problems are you actually solving for? Uh, or goals that you're enabling uh, would be would be helpful up front, but I think you did a good job like leading up the story into the app. Um, so a couple of things all over the place. Um, one, I think yes, you're introducing a really cool new concept. Um, I think you could do well to um, add some onboarding context, education. What what does a first time user experience look like? You're going to have to um, integrate your calendars, integrate your reminders. Um, like what does that onboarding look like? And how are you getting people to understand what intentions are? Um, teach me about them and you know, hold my hand a little bit more. Uh, along with that, I thought it was pretty bare bones, the UI. I like the super simplicity, but I was wondering, um, intentions are kind of a thing, right? I don't know how often they, they change or, or are, are completed, but like, can you personalize them a bit more? Can I select from a set of icons uh, that just like, let me see like what those things are at a glance? Cause you know, 95% of time of the time, like UI is really, it, it's words, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but your UI is like primarily words and that the, the, the um, you know, that places the onus on the user to have to like read through everything to then be able to 
parse out like what are they looking to select right so i just wonder if that could help you um uh, add some like hierarchy to your to your screens as well um uh so this whole concept of like scheduling for productive free time um i'm right there with drew on on like a lot of meetings like I was curious to know, and maybe you've researched this, like how much time is necessary to have productive free time? Like, are you going to fill in half hour slots on my calendar? And now I'm going to feel even more stressed because the few like half hours that I had, like now, you know, are taken up for where I, where I have to read quickly. I'm like, wait, how am I matching intentions for, you know, to my actual day? So it made me wonder if like, are you able to assign maybe some, um, maybe there's context or like meta information to a day. So I could say, Saturdays and Sundays is typically good for these intentions, but Monday through Friday, don't bother me with like, you know, um, oh, you should really, yeah, pick up that cross stitching uh, habit. I'm like, no, I'm not doing that during work, right? Like trying to like, you know, parse it out to, to make like good defaults and good decisions on behalf of me, I think is hard, um, but you might need a little more information to know like what I think about my days. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one thing, so I'm a, personally a big devoted fan of like the GTD, like get David Allen's like getting things done approach. Um, the question I have is like, and, and I learned this through that approach, like there's a big differentiation. A lot of times people mix this up, but he calls things, they're either projects or areas of focus. Areas of focus are just like uh, standards of, that you're looking to maintain over time, right? Like my health, my, my finances, uh, my apartment. Um, projects have an end date right so i want to know like is an intention something that's ending like because if it keeps sliding because i have more and more, let's say you're you're running towards finals and your days are just busier um did i just miss my deadline to accomplish a thing because there were no days that I could actually slot into um you know that would be kind of a miss for a calendar uh, and task tracking app right so i kind of want to know like how you're thinking about intentions like are these just things that you just they kind of like float in and float out and it's okay you just like you make progress as you want to but you don't have to make progress by a certain time right um yeah. and i think also i think ali might have mentioned this but like maybe the integration of like the tasks and integrations like would be a little more helpful like are there certain things i need to check off to like make pro show that I'm making progress, right? So you want to incentivize people and communicate back to them that they are making progress, and that's that's how you ha like keep them going. Um, and I would definitely encourage like looking into those motivating behaviors. Uh, and last thing, quickly, um, you you had very limited like cal uh, calendar functionality. Uh, so just something to consider. I know this is like prototype world, but if you're looking to get someone to switch over from their calendar app but you're not offering them the ability to like invite other people or like all the standard things that you would expect, the alerts and reminders, but like all those things that you would expect from your calendar app, um, people might, you, you might lose out on adoption because it's like so oversimplified that they're missing like things that you, everyone kind of expects from a calendar app these days. Um, so just kind of a, you know, a push to like, think about like your core functionality and requirements and like, what do people really expect and like, you know, where are they willing to like adopt new behaviors within like an already very busy uh, kind of app uh, ecosystem. But great job, keep pushing it. I like this idea a lot. Thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you, Fiorella. Okay, and now we will move on to Logan, Brittany, Jordan, and Kiki. All right, present mode, cool. Can everyone hear me? Cool. Hi, we are the Stride Learning Team. My name is Kiki, I'm the project manager. I'm Jordan, developer. I'm Brittany, also developer. And I'm Logan, UI UX designer. We have been working with a learning center in Broomfield called Stride, and we wanna start with a short message from the CEO, Brandon Slade. Stride Learning is a startup that helps students with ADHD and dyslexia perform in school. Our students are very bright, but struggle in school due to deficits in the frontal lobe of their brain called executive function skills. What executive function skills are, is the ability to plan out your week, the ability to reverse engineer a large project or assignment into small chunks to help you be successful. 
What Kiki, Jordan, Brittany, and Logan did is created an app for us to work with all of our students that helps us break down our weeks into small manageable chunks. It also allows for us to hold our students accountable and interact with them throughout the week in a safe way. At Stride, we're so grateful for what this group did for us. This is a truly transformational app for our startup, and we're very excited to implement it with our kids. So the question we asked ourselves at the beginning of this endeavor, as Brandon touched on, was how might we create a planning and communication app that's geared directly towards students who struggle with executive functioning tasks and can benefit Stride directly? The most common student Stride works with are students with dyslexia and ADHD. So we needed to create an app that was easy to use, that followed Stride's daily practices and routines, and that had a simple yet engaging design. In addition, as Stride continues to scale, they needed a platform to encourage communication that can be tracked and monitored rather than the current system of sending regular text messages between college-aged mentors and high school-aged students. These problems became the driving force for each decision we made, both with functionality and design. Thus, for our capstone project, we set out to create an iOS mobile app for Stride in order to streamline their planning and communication tools in a way that benefits both their students and their mentors. Since the chat-based feature was the main component of this app, a lot of research went towards figuring out the best API to do this. We researched APIs like ScaleDrone, PubNub, and Stream, but we ultimately ended up going with Firebase due to its ability to sync real-time data, its powerful authentication system that was easy to implement, its scalability, and more. Additionally, Firebase archives all of its messages indefinitely in until the database is manually cleared, which was an important feature Stride was looking for since they wanted to keep a record of all message threads in the case legal issues arise. Two apps we looked into and gained inspiration from include both Wonderlist and the default iPhone Notes app. The simplicity of both apps was its main drawing point as it was really easy to add tasks, view the to-do list for the week, and both apps offered multi-user collaboration. Therefore, we wanted the planner section of our own app to include all of these aspects for an intuitive experience. The way Stride operates is having three lists, tasks for the current week, tasks for the next week to plan ahead, and tasks of the previous week in case the student didn't finish something. The mentors at Stride had mainly been using the iPhone Notes app and had to manually update the dates for each week, which became tedious. Our planner page seeks to solve this by programmatically populating the current week task with the next week's task at the start of each week, therefore removing the need to manually transfer everything. So like Brittany mentioned, we use similar planning and messaging apps for reference as we began pr our prototyping phases. Uh, because our app needed to feel minimally distracting while also functional enough for our audience, we had to prototype strategically. Like most prototypes, we started out sketching on paper what we wanted our app to look like without any code restrictions or design restrictions. Uh, we then transitioned into Adobe Illustrator where we could start to work with things like our actual color scheme and we can develop a rough wireframe from artboard to artboard and truly begin to develop the flow of our app in more of a digital way. Our next step was to develop an Envision prototype to begin imagining the user experience and actual flow of our app from page to page. Envision allowed us to create the closest thing that we could get to an actual app before getting into any code. So it was a really good reference for what our app could look like moving forward. And then as we transitioned from prototype to code, only about getting the most important functional components of our app working, such as the three page spread from profile to messages to planner, as well as the mentor student connection, um, and then the messaging and planning pages as well. We made sure to get all these pages entirely functional before beginning to design the actual UI of each page. Now with any prototyping, it's possible to lose some of the ideas you had on paper due to code restrictions or limitations. Uh, and after creating each of these prototypes, the hardest thing for us was transitioning from each prototype phase seamlessly, not to lose any functionality or design decisions that we had made prior to each transition. Uh, this is why coding the full functionality before any design implementation was so important for us. Uh, and it allowed us to work well as a team with two people focused on functionality and to focus fully on design. We're extremely proud of our entire process from the beginning to end and it has ultimately led us to the app that we now do have on test flight. So we encourage you to download it and test it out. And now I'm gonna be walking you through our app with a live demonstration. 
So we first wanted to show you the app on an iPhone home screen so you can not only see the app icon, but also see how it looks integrated with other apps. When you open the app, you're taken to our login and register page. After filling out your information and clicking register, you're sent a verification email that contains a link to click on that confirms the email address you entered is in fact a real email. So I'm gonna go ahead and verify that now. Once you verify it, you're taken to this page, which helps us distinguish between our types of users, students and staff. For staff, we ask them to fill out their role, which could range from being a mentor to the CEO. For students, we ask them to fill out their grade and school, which is information that's useful to our mentors later. Our mentors work with many different students, so it can be easy for them to forget which grade each student is in and where they go to school. This way, they have easy access to that information. The final step is the verification code, which is something we added to ensure that those who are using the app are in fact affiliated with Stride. As a student, this is something you would get from a mentor, and as a mentor, it is something you would get from someone higher up than you. Once you log in, you're taken to our messages page. We chose this as the first page you see when you open the app because we decided that the communication was the key functionality piece that we wanted to highlight and focus on. I'm not going to show two simulators so we can not only see the messaging working in real time, but also so we can see how the app differs for both students and mentors. To create a new message, you click the messaging icon in the right hand corner. You're taken to a contacts page where you can search or scroll to find who you want to message. After clicking on their name and typing in the input box and pressing send, you can see that the message does appear on the receiver screen. To message them back, you click on their name and follow the same steps. This is what a conversation looks like for senders and receivers. The next piece of functionality is the planner. As you can see, this is where it starts to differ for mentors and students. I'm first going to focus on the student view, which is the simulator on the right hand side. Students see a three week layout that includes last week, this week, and next week. We decided on this layout because of the way students and mentors meet. For example, they can meet on a Wednesday and need to plan Thursday through Sunday, as well as through the next Wednesday. We included last week so that when mentors and students meet, they can look at the previous week and see what was and wasn't completed. If something wasn't completed, they can still see this information and add it to this week's tasks if needed. As Brittany mentioned, this information is automatically updated at the beginning of each week so that this week's tasks move to last week and next week's move to this week. To add a new task, you click the plus icon and you're presented with a pop-up. You can use the pickers to select the day and week you wanna add a task to. Once you type it in and press add task, you can see that it shows up on the planner. To show you've completed the task, you simply tap it, which shows the check mark. You also have the ability to delete a task if you no longer need it by long pressing. As a mentor, you see the students you work with. To add a new student, you click the, click the plus icon and select a student from a list. Once they're in your student list, you can click their name and see their planner in real time. This is useful so that our mentors can keep tabs on their students throughout the week and see how they're doing completing their tasks. Finally, the last piece of functionality is the profile page. And here you can see your user's general information. As a mentor, you see your role and email. And as a student, you see your grade, school, mentor, and email. The mentor information is automatically filled out when a mentor adds the student to their list. Users have the ability to edit their profile, which is useful if their role within Stride changes, you complete a school year, or you change schools. You can also edit your email and password, which is, goes through another verification process. Finally, users can edit their profile picture by clicking on their picture. Once they click on it, their camera roll pops up and they can select a picture to customize their profile. We're so happy with how our app turned out and we can't wait for Stride to start using it. Thank you. Okay, reviewers. Awesome work, um, looks like a lot. Um, I think just one thing that really also shines through is the, the collaboration necessary to, to get something like this off the ground, so bravo. Um, also really cool to see you working with an actual, um, I'll just call them a client business. Uh, just, you know, you, you start hitting up against the real world constraints pretty quickly. So uh, I imagine um, that took a little, or there was a lot to learn from, from that as well. Um, so, just really quickly, um, uh, just kind of like a delivery thing, but I think all the way up front, you had a lot of voiceover. Um, you showed the video 
and there was a little bit of like intro from the CEO and then like the out, the output, like how happy he was that this was a transformational and excited for next steps. Uh, and then when you started talking, like there, a lot of the voiceover was uh, either could be visualized, right? It was just like a lot of sitting on one slide uh, and some of it was duplicative with your initial video. Um, just, you know, reiterating that it was for uh, ADHD students, et cetera. So maybe just think of like how you can tighten that up as a pitch. Um, but I think overall you had the, the points to be telling. Um, I was very curious to know if there was testing with students. I didn't catch that, but um, upfront, I imagine there were stakeholder interviews. You probably interviewed the CEO, maybe some staff to understand what their key pain points are and like where the opportunities were. Um, there, I don't know if there were student interviews, not just like testing of your prototype, but did you interview any students? Did you have access to them? Um, could be helpful to just like synthesize some of those learnings um, to really make that, um, you know, to show that you did that part of the process. Cause that's always pretty much, uh, you know, at least in you know, all projects I work on, that's always like a key step is making sure you're, you're understanding uh, before you start exploring. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, from a UI perspective, uh, I like how clean it is. I think, um, there are some considerations that I would definitely push on. For example, um, you know, a lot of your app was form inputs. Um, so, for example, there was one that says, like, what grade are you in? Um, does that really need to be an open input, right? What if somebody, if, I don't know, or you're just talking about students that are, like, you know, freshman through senior, can that be a, a radio button that you just select, right? Like, uh, or a drop down or whatever. Like, if you standardize that type of information, your data and your data model, you know, the data that you're collecting become cleaner, right? What if somebody writes an SR and somebody writes the word senior? Like, I don't know how, how uh, impactful that might be, but it's just something to consider while you're designing, like, um, for every form input, is that the right input? Uh, and, and is it necessary to give open areas to, you know, of text versus, because um, it's a lot harder to do analysis on, on all of that data. Um, also, I think um, one of the core, like the killer pieces of functionality is this whole planner. And I think you could do a little bit of a, a, a better job to uh, clarify that UI. So I didn't know that I could swipe between like last, this and next week panels. Um, and likewise, I think even like being able to complete tasks, um, you mentioned that, you know, just double tapping on it shows the, the check mark. But even like an empty circle would be a, more of like a visual affordance or a hint to let me know what I could do with that thing. Um, is it movable between days, right? Can I just like long press on it and, and move it over? Um, but I don't know if that's where like maybe some onboarding could be helpful or just like, you know, a little bit more of like visual uh, help. Um, and that's where I think testing this, you know, on a usability level um, with, with some of the students could be really insightful as well. But um, overall, great job. I know it takes a lot to like make something like this, uh, bring it to fruition and make it come alive. So um, really, um, you know, great demonstration of working together as a team. Thank you. Hey guys, um, I thought this was great as well. I thought that your representation of a real world team was really strong. Um, I had a few comments kind of related to what Mark was saying. Uh, some of the uses of your um, native alerts were kind of used in new ways. So one thing I noticed was, I think it was a date picker that had two scrollable elements within one piece of UI. Typically you see that in like a bottom sheet or iCal is a good example of this. When you tap a day, it drops down and the picker is right in line. So just paying a little bit of attention to um, common use cases so that you know users are used to like knowing how to use your app right off the bat. Uh, also, I thought the framing of this app being for students with ADHD was really strong, but I thought uh, maybe that could have been carried through as a concept in the app itself. So as Mark was saying, like, is that introduced in onboarding maybe? Um, and also, like, as a student of ADHD, I don't know, I don't have ADHD, but is there something about the functionality that becomes compelling for that user group? So is the way the UI is designed more beneficial for them? than you know, another task-based app. That could be something to think about. Um, I would have loved to see some of the logo treatment in the UI. I thought it was nice that um, the app was so simple and the way it was designed, but there are a few core elements there like the logo mark and the gradient that you could use to make your app feel a little bit more branded throughout the screens that you were showing. Um, and then I thought just something to think about is that I believe the student has the ability to input their mentor. 
I thought that was interesting from a user perspective because in theory, the mentor is like the role that is helping the student complete their tasks. So it's a lot of trust to be putting in that person. So I would maybe think about automating that if you find through user testing that that becomes an issue. My cat is commenting also. <laughs> and uh, yeah, great work. Uh, I thought the use of how might we use in this presentation automatically, I was like, okay, cool, real world scenario, I get it. The user actually cannot um, input their mentor just to answer that question. It's like okay. when the mentor adds that student on the page, it automatically populates that mentor field for them. And up until that point, it's blank. But yeah, that's so good. Back. Gotcha. Is that a like a white list that um, the company is providing to the app? So it's from any of the student list that you're seeing on the left here. So all those are all new students who have downloaded and used this app and who are not yet assigned a mentor. So then when the mentor goes to their planner and adds them as a student, it'll populate that just like Jordan showed right there, that uh, mentor field. Um, I guess my last comment is uh, when you were showing the initial designs, my cat is really involved. <laughs> 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 um, I thought it would be beneficial to show like a test based user flow or a wireframe just to clarify those interactions because maybe then when I got to this part of the project, I would have a few less questions about the functionality here. Definitely. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, this is fun, y'all. Also, yeah, like my first thing, I was like, hey, how am I the exclamation point? Yeah, like I was like, oh, okay, you, you guys are, you guys are doing real things. Um, the, I mean, no matter where you go with this project and your relationship with this startup, like the learnings of working together and kind of the balancing, like the back and forth between your steps and like the, the, the design and development and the prototyping, like I would document those at least for your own brain like as specific as you can about like the things you had to negotiate and learn because like that's like perfect beautiful interview fodder for like when you're interviewing for one of those roles and like how you come to those things and how you come to consensus like that's just normal life like you're on teams that have 15 people and you have to do that endlessly all day so being able to talk about that really intelligently i think will really work well for you like you guys also did <laughs> y'all did so many amazing like things you like, I, like I think you should fully acknowledge like how many things. Like even in the demo when you went to um, the email and you had like a million other like verification emails. I'm like, yeah, like actually, which is amazing. It's like you've clearly spent time like doing like essentially what you did was plan um, use cases to verify. Like you did legitimate like quality assurance testing to make sure that like your use cases worked and like that's a part of building a thing and that's really impressive and so. It was lovely to see that. I mean, the demo is just like super hot in general, like having both screens there, like you all prepared it so well. It was really lovely to see. Um, in the interface itself, um, I think people, a couple of uh, the other critics touched on this a little bit, but like there's some, some. Uh, I mean, I, I can see how you like balance like the realisticness of implementing it and like, like the vision of things, which is totally fun. Like that's like how everything in the world gets built. Um, some of the things that are kind of transparent, like the swiping or like the long touch to delete, I'm not sure anyone would know to do those things. So um, it'll be really interesting to see just when you get in the hands of kids, like what do they do? And then is that a problem and or not? Like it's really hard to know like what becomes intuitive or not there. Um, and because there's because this is so real world and like you started with like your relationship with the company, um, like at the end you were like, we're excited to, to like get this into the hands of people. Like it would be really nice to end with like concrete next steps. So it's like, okay, the company is gonna start using this in six weeks and is rolling it out or we're gonna prototype it or I don't, I don't know what it is, but like I think I'm sure y'all have specific next, next steps. And like, because it's kind of a full like kind of business story and the relationship with your client, it would be really nice to show that because it's just showing that like, you know, no matter what you build, there's always the next thing. There's always a something better to do, right? So, and like, I know that's already in your brains. Like you can tell that that's like y'all are thinking there. So talking about that would be uh, really nice to see as well. It could be like the pilot program, right? It's like X amount of students are gonna start using this with one cohort right before it rolls out to the, to the larger team. Yes. And, and there's good, I think this goes back to your point where you mentioned like 
like seeing more of the process and like uh, documenting that that timeline right it's like okay next is the pilot and that's going to run for the three to six months and then that rolls out uh and we'll you know have another round of testing before we re synthesize that and read that back out to the larger uh you know to the ceo and the larger team um but that all like yeah like drew said that that makes it so real world it's just like instantly like i mean not to get like super tactical but like yeah employers looking at, at portfolios are like oh, okay, this person understands how to be, you know, working and like, you know, functioning on a team and like part of uh, a workplace environment. And they'll probably understand the trade-offs that go into like making things like this. So it'll make my job easier because they have experience with this. Um, and and to, that, to that end, um, you know, building on your point, Drew, one thing I was thinking was like, even showing that process visually, um, there's a lot, you, you guys are super articulate, really great talking. It would be great to visualize some of this stuff. Like if I even saw a Gantt chart that showed, okay, up front, it was, um, you know, the, the initial, you know, requirements gathering, stakeholder interviews, and like research to, you know, all the way to synthesis. Um, that shows me like, okay, cool. Phase one of the project, they explored this. They really were able to like work with their client. But next, I'm very curious, like, um, you know, it's very easy to work like very agilely in, uh, you know, with the other students in your environment. What, at what points did you bring your client back in? You know, how often were you getting feedback from him? And was it just the CEO? Did he have a board or like, you know, other people he was operating with that like you had to negotiate 10 people's feedback? Um, were there things you had to fight for from a design and tech perspective? Or where were those points of friction where you had to like come to, okay, you know, with the CEO, like we could do what you're asking, but that's going to push out the timeline uh, three months. We need to hit a certain deadline to prove this. So where can we, you know, uh, you know, uh, compromise and, and where won't we compromise? Like just talking a little bit about that process and like how you managed it. Um, and I, I think that would be super illustrative of how mature the process was and uh, you all were to like bring this to the finish line because, you know, products die a death of a thousand cuts, right? So you probably set out with all the great intentions and like, you know, were things made or how to be tweaked and like it, you know, it looks like it, you kept it to your original strategy uh, from the beginning, but you're kind of missing that storytelling in the middle. And I know there are things that happened where you're like, you know, you had to kind of wrestle with reality a little bit. No project ever runs just like super perfectly. So it would be cool to just like hear a little bit of that. Right. I'm actually a mentor at Shred. I've worked there for like two years. So this is in user testing with them. My students are brutally honest. So gotta love that. <laughs> so we'll get yes. lots, of, lots of good feedback in the next uh, few weeks here and see where that goes moving forward. But thank you all for your feedback. Yeah, I just wanted to add it's on it is on test flight and you all can download it. We have it linked through all the of our product documentation, which we can give you. But yeah, it is on test flight and getting tested. Yeah, and that link is in the uh, spreadsheet. So you can look in the spreadsheet and follow the link if you want to take a look. Thank you so much. Excellent work. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Thank you. Okay, so that was the last uh, presentation of this session. Um, I want to give a um, uh, round of applause to uh, all of the students. Excellent work. Great job. I'll unmute for that. Yeah. <laughs> this is a crazy time in the world and was like the professionalism and like preparedness and like. It just y'all handled it real well is what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> um, and i also wanted to give a round of applause to our reviewers thank you so much for taking time out of your days to come here and give some feedback it's really nice thank you thank you so we have about a seven minute break until the next session and uh we will see you all back for that thank you this was Great fun job, thanks y'all bye guys